So we'd like to welcome you to the second in a series of online conversations that the Salahuquelmuk government will be offering in the coming months. Our hope is that these chats will light the fire in our community members as we continue on a path to implementing our inherent rights to self-determination and self-government. Since this event is streaming live on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, don't hesitate to tell your friends and family that they're welcome to join. It will also be posted on our page afterwards so that people can see it at their leisure. As I've already introduced myself and the SXG briefly, for anyone who does not know us, I'm the multimedia coordinator for the SXG, and we are six Stalo communities that are working together to create a Stalo Hukwama government among other communities in the Stalo nation, as well as new government to government relationships with the provincial and federal governments. Our communities are Achalitz, Lakamal, Skalluk, Skalkale, Chiacto, and Yekakuyas. Tonight, we are honored to have three very influential speakers joining us to discuss bringing our ancestors home. Let me introduce our host for the Light the Fire series, Kulikwultul Grand Chief Stephen Point. He is the SXG's Chief Negotiator and Chief Legal Advisor. He is also currently the Chancellor of the University of British Columbia, the former Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia, and he's practiced law and sat on the provincial court bench for many years. He is also a member of the Skelkill First Nation and served as chief from 1975 to 1999. From 1994 to 99, he served as tribal chair of the Stalo Nation. During that time, the Stalo Nation entered the BC treaty process. We also have tonight with us um, a dear relative of mine, my uncle Tikwalatsa, Herb Joe. He has worked tirelessly in our communities in the in the arena of corrections. He's headed up a lot of our traditional practices and bringing those practices back to the Stolo Nation. He has a lot more that he is going to share with us tonight, I'm sure, and I'm just really excited to have him join our circle this evening. Uh, we also have Dave Sheppy, uh, who has been very instrumental in a lot of the work in our communities around archeology. span um, Dr. Sheppy also has a large, resume that would take a long time to go over at this time where he has worked hand in hand with the Stello people to ensure that a lot of our artifacts and our traditional sites have been discovered and they've also been protected through the work that he's doing with the SRMC. My role today will be to start the panel off with a question or two, let the conversation roll, and we'll also have some further questions from anyone that's out there with the Facebook Live or on YouTube that's watching. After about 40 minutes, we're going to leave some time for the audience members to ask questions as well. These can be posted in the Facebook Live or YouTube chat and emailed to outreach at sxta.bc.ca. So there's many ways that you can engage with us tonight. So without further ado, we're going to be moving on. I got to grab some of my notes here to our very first question for everybody's that is on the panel tonight. The first question is about this work of bringing the ancestors home. Well, what does that really mean, both I think physically and spiritually? Why is there a need for us to bring these ancestors home? And what kind of places have you all or, or some been involved with in order to make these arrangements? And I guess the last part of the question is, how did the effort to bring the ancestors home get started? Um, I know it's kind of jam packed, so feel free to you know take bits and pieces of what I said and just share with the people how this work got started here in Stalo territory. This is, can you, can you hear me okay? <clears throat> this is, uh... A difficult topic because the um, you know have mixed mixed uh, feelings about the whole topic of moving ancestors right and but it's it's one of those 
consequences of colonialism that struck us here. On, on the one hand, our own people would never um, intentionally disturb uh, someone that's interned in the ground. But our customs a long time ago, and I'm referring to the Stalo custom, we didn't intern people. They weren't placed in the ground. They were placed in boxes wrapped in blankets after spending about a year uh, placed in a tree. These trees exist still today out on the Higginson Road by River, River Road in Higginson. The trees there, places where the bodies used to be tied up. People that were buried were, were often uh, in war time, buried where they were, where they were, were killed. Um, and bad medicine people, I'm told, were buried face down. So um, uh, when science has come around to try to uh, determine questions like how long people have been here, who's been here in historic times, uh, these bones of our ancestors have been found and taken and studied and analyzed. And on the one hand, it's providing information that's helpful in our analysis as to who we are as all of people and how long we've been on the land and, and it's helpful from that perspective. Uh, on the other hand, spiritually, it's very sensitive because <clears throat> you're disturbing someone that uh, was never intended to be moved, was never intended to be disturbed. And in our in our society, I believe it's it's uh, it's considered a bad thing to uh, to move move someone, to bother them once they've been in in the ground. But I'm sure my my spiritual father there, Herb, will talk a little bit about that, explain it better than I can about what how we feel about that. Um, and I, I'm glad that. Dr. Sheppy's with us because he's been helping us, helping us with this work of looking into our history, looking into uh, these sites where uh, for thousands of years people have lived. And the evidence is, is very much strengthening our own views and claims as to how long we've been here and the fact that this is our land. So that's why I say I. I come to the discussion with, with kind of mixed feelings. Um, but it's, it's really not our fault. It's, it's the fault of the fact that things changed when Europeans arrived. Um, um, part of their scientific quest is to sort of analyze these, these kinds of things to gain knowledge. And, um, Europeans have traveled all over the world, and that's part of what they do is to get knowledge, to, to learn more things. And so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Uncle Herb for a minute mm -hmm. and ask him to sort of uh, explain a little bit better than I can. You know, the, the reverence, the sacredness of the task that's often before us when, when universities ask us to bring people home. Just, just really quickly before uh, we hear from Uncle Herb, I want to welcome Sunny McKelsey, Nagakatsi, to join our panel discussion this evening. He has also been involved in this work and working alongside our elders and our people for many, many years. And we're so happy that you're able to join the discussion this evening. We're starting out uh, with talking about the work of bringing our ancestors home, why we're needing to do this work, what kind of 
place displacement has happened to our ancestors remains and and how this effort all got started so we're going to turn it over to uh uncle herb tikulatsa at this time to to give us a little bit of uh insight input into how we're starting tonight's discussion um thank you all for for being here tonight and bringing this issue to the forefront. Um, it's something that you know, our leaders and elders that uh, have held very sacred for all the time that we've been here. Um, I remember my two of my one men I call my uncles. There's um, some Lanuk and Siam Namak from Musqueam, Vincent and Walker Stogan. Over, well, over 50, 54 years ago, um, I was claimed by these two gentlemen and as, as the part of their family. And, and I have had the honor of um, being taught by them while they were still here with us. And one of the important things that I remember them saying to me was the sacredness of our ancestors. And they went on to explain that the old ones were always there to teach us about who we are. And in teaching us who we are, of course, they have to explain those of our families and our our tribes who have left left before us, our ancestors. You know, and I know, for instance, they in today's world, um, our 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 peoples put our loved ones in the ground. They bury them in, in what cemeteries. And, you know, Alekhotel like talked about um, the people who lived on Yukokus and Skalkeo putting their, their deceased in boxes and, and putting those boxes up in the trees. Well, that was done for a purpose. You know, that if you look back in history, well, the Chilliwag River ran right through their, their front door. So logical, our ancestors weren't gonna put their loved ones in, in the water, in the ground, you know, where the water's gonna be rising every time. So they learned to put them in a place where it was safe. They put them in cedar boxes and put them up in the trees and until the poor weak human being, part of them left and returned to mother earth to be one and with mother earth again. And the bones that remained were gathered and wrapped up again and put into a larger box that went back up in the trees again. And it wasn't until, um, well, my namesake, Techolatza, uh, he was the CM at Iquikos at that time. When the first missionaries, first priests got into Iquikos and Skalkeo, or in Iquikos because that old church is there. And that priest who got there uh, converted the old Techolatza to Christianity, to Catholicism. And he convinced them to take those boxes down and bury them. And he made them bring all of those ancestors over to a cemetery that they created in, in Chiacto. But they wouldn't allow our elders to bury our ancestors in the, in the cemetery because they weren't baptized. I remember Uncle Richie telling me that. And it wasn't until after those priests, that priest there had left, that Uncle Richie extended the fence and included our ancestors in the ground. And this, again, it was not about Catholicism or Christianity, it was about the sacredness of those lives. You know, um, I think when those teachers were there, they taught us that 
and the beginning of time, Chital Siam created what we now today know as human beings. And in, in the creation of them, he took all, some of those that walk on four legs, took some of those that swim in the water, took some of those that fly in the sky, took some of those that crawl on their bellies, ground. And he converted them into what we know today as human beings. And each one was created unique and special and individual. And after he created them, he allowed them to move around what was then their home. And he found that there was so much confusion amongst them because in their shuli, their spirit, they were still an eagle, they were still a wolf, they were still a snake. And they had a human body. So he came back and he gave them all a special gift to create a better world for these poor, weak human beings to be there. He gave them what we today, today call the sentient mind or a brain that could think and reason. And then in order to make that sentient mind work, he gave each of those little human beings a primary task in life. That primary task was what? Was to learn for the rest of their lives. And today we have traditions that tell us that we're all born unique individuals, but that we, we, we need to be taught that we have to spend the rest of our lives learning, learning what? Learning how to live together in a good way. See, all of these things are all part and parcel of the way our elders taught us about who we are as human beings, what our responsibilities are here, and one of the things that they told us too is that we all have this poor, weak human being body and that it's only a temporary thing. And when the human, human being part of us ceases to exist, stops living, that, that poor, weak human, human being body will return to Mother Earth and become part of Mother Earth again. And what happens to the spirit? Shuli. It lives on forever. And that's what our funeral services were based on in the past. We all were taught that in the other side where all of the Shuli lives, all the spirits live, some of them are allowed to come to Mother Earth for a short time to be part of a human being. But at the end of that time, they're going to go back home to be with the other spirits there them that are our, are our future and our, our past. That spirit in us, what we call Shuli, never dies. It's, it's never dead. That never has died. So when today we have human remains taken to another place, what happens to that Shuli? Is it going with that, those remains? Is there separation? All of those questions remain. And there's never any true settling or satisfaction of those of us who are left behind until we can account for those remains. And in this case, bring them home to where they started their, being, their life as a human being. So it's a sacred duty for us as re, human beings who re, remain here on this, on this earth to tend to that part of our lives that um, our elders and our, were taught by their, our ancestors, this is our responsibility. This is what we have to um, tend to. And I'm sure Dr. Dave is going may be able to talk about that when I was you know given this name by Falachalto. I didn't know the significance of the name. And I it took me 25, 30 years to grow into the responsibility of carrying this name. And along the way, 
Dave and I connected and we've been brothers ever since. And there's a house turned one of my ancestors to stone and we were told by the elders that the Shuli of that, that your ancestor is inside that stone statue. He's alive like you and me. And my grand aunties told me that when it was time to find out what to do about it, of course, I went to them and asked them. And uh, one of them turned up to me and told look and said, okay, grandson, you carry the name, you bring him home. And I had no idea what that meant. So I went down to the Burke Museum where he was and I visited him a couple of times. I took aunties, my grand aunties down there once. And they in turn told the curator and the director of the Burke Museum, that this is our ancestor and he's alive. And as long as he's here in your home, you have to look after him. Every night you put him to bed, every morning you wake him up. And the uh, staff at the Burke Museum started to do that. And after 15 years with Dr. Sheppy's um, invaluable help, we were able to bring him home here to our, to our, our home here and allow him to continue to do the work that he was given in the beginning of time there. So there's a spiritual part of this work that we're doing that very often doesn't get spoken about. And hopefully I introduced that part of it to our discussion tonight. And I know all of the rest of you will have comments to make and maybe short stories to share. So thank you for um, listening to me and thank you for joining us here tonight. Yes, you could see. I could see. Thank you, Chief Lanza. Um, this is such a sensitive discussion, and but it's very important for especially the younger generations to become clear on on this uh, the relevance and the responsibility that comes with uh, taking care of the ancestors. Um, I'm just going to turn to. Dr. Dave now, and you mentioned by Herb there in relation to the returning of people to the stone, but you've been involved in this work for a long time with the Skull and Elk and uh, this whole process of returning uh, is still going on. I, I, I believe Chiam just had a return just a few weeks ago of members of their community for all people. And I know that you're in contact with different institutions like universities and museums that have ancestors. Can you talk a little bit about the work that you've been doing, Dave? Certainly, certainly. And just want to uh, thank you and uh, Alia, Sharon, uh, the, the, the folks at the uh, SXTA for putting this on. It's a great venue and appreciate you inviting me here to speak to the topic of repatriation, bringing, bringing ancestors back, your ancestors particularly. And Chief Kolatsa was, you know, telling that story of the, the bringing home of Stone Take So that was my first experience starting to work here at Stalination in 1997. Uh, and had the great fortune to be arriving in a place where there was Sonny, Herb, yourself, Stephen, Gwent, and Helen, some key cultural advisors that, unbeknownst to me, were just absolute good fortune to have around me as an archaeologist coming to work in the Stalo Indigenous community. And it became very clear and very soon that there was a strong family interest, the Joe family, the story of the attempt and the efforts to bring Stone Tikwalatsa, that, that transformed ancestor, 
back from the Burke Museum um, was compelling and something that attracted my attention and just uh, felt that I needed to put myself forward as in whatever way I could to be of help and assistance. And effectively, that's the role I play. Uh, what you spoke to is the significance, the need, the caretaking responsibilities is all a, the cultural foundation that I can only work to understand through your through your speaking to to you know to this matter to these uh, to how to do things properly and and why it's necessary uh, so for me it's been an introduction as that this is a need uh, and what can I do with the, any skill sets that I can bring and turn from a colonial a colonial situation a colonial learning process that I went through especially around archaeology into something that can be beneficial to the community and to help repair, make reparations to the losses that Stalo and other communities have suffered as a result of colonialism over the past you know, history of that, those relations. Uh, and there are many, many ancestors uh, throughout that whole history of colonialism that were taken from here, removed without anybody's consent, no one's permission, contrary to your cultural beliefs, your cultural ways, and that the efforts have been going on for at least you know the past 20 or 30 years to try to find out uh, where those ancestors are and what institutions and what museums, what research facilities. And uh, Helen, who just went by there, I know for a fact that some of the work we picked up more recently, she was working on in 1994 at Stalo Nation, trying to find those institutions. So the work and my understanding of it goes back sort of that, that far. Uh, my involvement started around 1998 and continues to today with um, the assistance of the Stalo House of Respect Caretaking Committee. That's a group of advisors. Everybody here is linked into that uh, on the screen here today and, and many, many others. It started in 2005, 2006, when the Museum of Anthropology at UBC asked the question, what, how guide us to guide the staff there in the treatment of ancestral remains that they were taking care of at the time, uh, when they knew that they were gonna have to move them as part of a large collaborative project that we were also involved in, um, that was a renovation of a big portion of their facility. So Herb, Helen, a number of folks went down to UBC, spoke to the museum caretakers, curators, <clears throat> and provided advice as to how to properly care for ancestors who needed to be moved for that purpose. And the question was put forward, ultimately, do you want these ancestors back? And the answer was yes. <laughs> so it became a question of how to do that. Uh, so, and this is interesting because in a, in a situation where you have a willing museum, a, will, a museum is willing to return ancestors. Uh, and I think we, there were 11 initially or, or ultimately that did end up coming back. It took six years of dialogue among Stalo cultural knowledge holders to work through the consideration of how to do this in a good way, right? How to do this in consideration of surely the impacts to the communities, the, the possibility of doing testing research that was informed by the communities and, and useful to the families to find out about who these individuals were. Um, if you know where they were came from, how they were either excavated or found in some situation, ended up at the museum. Well, when did they live? Can you tell us more about them? Is it a, a male, female, young person, older person? What's their history? What's their life story? Uh, a lot of the discussions at the House of Respect Committee were about the possibility of doing, applying Western techniques and science to sample, to take samples and find out how, you know, answer some of those questions. Um, so six years of very, very deep dialogue. It really guided the process uh, and allowed for those ancestors to be brought back, uh, allowed for the, the building of a biographies around them to help inform how they can be treated respectfully uh, in, in bringing them back in a good way uh, and whatever next steps need to be taken by the communities acting as their families. Um, so more in that, that's continued. So since 2012, those ancestors were returned uh, we have a number of others that came back immediately following that from the Museum of Vancouver. Then more recently, as you mentioned, we'll equal to uh, three individuals from Simon Fraser University were repatriated by the Pilalt tribe. 
And then most recently, six individuals from the Royal BC Museum just a couple of weeks ago, uh, prior to this, to this you know, coming on here tonight. Uh, and so the, the, the committee is key. The cultural guidance is absolutely key. And it's nothing but an honor and a pleasure to work in that, in those hands to, uh, you know, help navigate, help, help navigate how to, how to bring these ancestors home. So I, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And I, I can't think of a better person than yourself to be doing this kind of work for our people mm -hmm. with integrity, with a good heart. And we owe a great debt to you for your kindness for what you've done for the people. I want to turn you. to my dear brother, Dr. Nakatsi. Um, you know, there's always teachings that, you know, we have, right? Some people call it Si'iwis, some people call it um, Sawayath. And I have such respect for Dr. Nakhetzi's research that he's done, the knowledge that he's gained from all the hard work and speaking to elders. Now, you know what we're talking about here, Sonny. Um, could you share your perspective on, on this whole thought about returning ancestors? Thank you very much and uh, greetings to everyone. Um, uh, thank you for uh, asking me to talk a little bit. And the sub subject that we're talking about, there's a lot of different um, Helkmalem words that provide a perspective and an understanding of our relationship uh, to our land and to us as people in relationship to our ancestors, relationship to obligations that we have of taking care of our ancestors and the same, the same, the, the same word uh, about taking care of the future generations as well. So a number of things to, that we need to look at. And when you look at this relationship that we have and you can see why we're doing what we're doing, why are we bringing bringing our ancestors home, why is it so important to us? You know, and if you don't think about it or don't look at the language, you just, you know in your heart that we have to do it, right? We do, some of it just do it because we know it's in our heart, but you start looking at the, the words and you start finding out uh, various teachings. I'm sorry, I have to put my glasses on, I can't read my screen. So the, the uh, phrase that the uh, elders from the Stolo Shali came up with uh, for us for, for bringing our ancestors home I wasn't part of that uh, research, so I'm not sure about the context of it. I'm hoping that it's a very old statement and that um, it was something that they're able to, to come up with really quick. But that, that statement in our language is, um, it means that we are bringing our ancestors home. Now, when you look at that statement, and what we need to do is also look at the, our history of bringing our ancestors home within our lifetime, most recently, and even in, from an archeological um, standpoint as well. Um, so one of the oldest um, examples that we know, Dave and Dave's familiar with this as well, we've talked about this, is that at the old village of Chathlath, there's the old um, Christian cemetery. Uh, Tichelata talked about that as well, how some of our ancestors weren't, who weren't baptized weren't allowed to be in the Christian cemetery. So, a lot of our burial grounds, there's the Christian cemetery and then there's the other burials be behind it. We're seeming to find, find that all over. But anyways, at, uh, at uh, Hethlaf, <clears throat> we find these two different, uh, two different uh, types of, uh, of um, burials, but also what we found was that there's a number of pit houses, two or three, Dave, I can't remember, at least two pit houses and on the edge there, we found rock cairns that look very similar to the rock cairns that are found at Skowitz. And we suspect that there are burials. We never, and we probably never will dig them up. I think we'll just go along with the oral history and go along with the fact that it's very similar to the rock cairns down at, uh, at Skowitz. But um, we also knew the oral history and that was documented in the reserve commissions as well about the people from the village of Kathlas moving down to Shohamel. And so our theory is, is that those people, when they passed away, they were brought home because there's, there's that important teaching of bringing people home, right? And so those people were probably brought back home and buried on the edge of their home, on the edge of their pit house. That's probably why those rock cairns are there. 
So that's the oldest example that I could think of. And also looking in my own family history, my understanding is that um, our great grandfather, my family's great grandfather, the late Dennis Peters from uh, Chowatal, they passed away in the 1940s, 1945, I believe it was. And he actually passed away down in Yakima. And back then there was a huge uh, undertaking to bring him back home. Uh, they had to bring him back home on a train. Uh, there were a lot of costs involved with that. There were some people that went out uh, doing a collection, you know, trying to make sure that they brought him back home. So he'd be buried there down at uh, down there at Chowatal. So that's another example. The most recent example in the last oh, seven, eight years, maybe, is I have a, a niece, her, her father was my um, second cousin from Union Bar, but she passed away down in uh, Mexico under very suspicious uh, circumstances that haven't been resolved yet. Uh, but the family, you know, it is in their hearts too, and everybody supported it as well, the important teaching of bringing her home. And I think a family paid her like five and a half thousand dollars to bring her from Mexico, bring her back home. Uh, so she could bury it up, up here at uh, Pecchotal or uh, Union Bar. So you can see those, you know, the archaeological part, um, 1940s and then the last decade, the importance of, uh, of doing that. Now, that's one part of it. The other part of it is we only have to look at uh, our name for ourselves and our connection to, to our environment, to our world, right? So we call ourselves Stalo, and for the longest time we've called ourselves that. And in the Halkmeon Dictionary, there also is the word um, Falmuch, but there never really was too much of a focus on that word until recently, and is recently brought out by the late uh, Yamalot, or Rosalind George, very respected uh, elder who brought this teaching out. And uh, how she brought it out was she told me at this one, one day when I was interviewing her, uh, she talked about a gathering that she was the night before, and she said this young fellow got up and uh, started talking and started talking about how he was Stalo. And she reminded him, she said, well, you're not only Stalo, you're also Falmuch. And she said that he's pretty rude about it and insisted that he was only Stalo and didn't want to be Falmuch, right? But, um, and then she, so she explained to me, she said, we are both Stalo and we are Falmuch. She says, when you look at the word Stalo, that only um, provides us with an attachment to the river, people of the river. Our attachment to the land is expressed in the word Falmuch. So if you look at Hwelmuch then, and look at the word Tamuch, which is the word for the land, so even the word for you're holding dirt in your hand, that's Tamuch as well, or it's the word for our land, or it's also the word for our world, like our, our big world that we call um, Tzalf um, So anyways, um, she says that um, if you look at the river, what does the river flow on top of? It flows on the land, right? And then, so when you look at that connection that we have Hwelmuch to Tamuch, and you see there's a connection that we have to the land. And uh, you only need to look at our neighbors as well. Like for instance, the Thompson people, they call themselves, and I, my father was in the Katmuch, uh, they call themselves in the Katmuch. And you look at the end of that word, you see Much as well. And in our language, that's what ties them to the land as well. It's got to do with their land. And also you look at the Shushwap. Um, Shushwap comes from, it's the English way of, mispronunciation of, of the word sekwapmuch, and you look at that word as well, much at the end, again, showing their connection to the land. And our brothers and sisters north of us at the other end of Harrison Lake, the Lillawat, um, of course, uh, they're, they call themselves um, Sklat Imch, they go Imch rather than Much, but that Imch part is what connects them to the land as well. So then you can see that connection to the land. There's the, you know, that word Hwalmuch and the word Tamuch provides that connection. But then how are we, how are we connected then? What is that important connection? And that's where our burial practices come in. And that's where you see, you know, there are some places where we did underground burials, and did burials and in mounds like at Scowlitz. And uh, once we once we found those out, um, Dave can tell you many other places that uh, our archaeologists, uh, him and the archaeologists have been working on where they found uh, um, mounds that are potentially burial mounds as well. And also there are other ways of uh, taking care of our ancestors. I know at uh, Squaditz, um, the late Elizabeth Herling talks about, a, a, um, oh, what do you call it? Um, uh, where they did a tree burial, but it was done on this uh, log that went across platform that was joined from one tree to the next. And she talks about how that was used right up until the 19, uh, 1920s. 
and our ancestors, our loved ones are wrapped in blankets and then put on top of that platform. And railroad, CNR Railroad, that went in between 1910, 1913, but she said in the 1920s, what had happened was some of the passengers uh, were complaining because some of the blankets were getting tattered and they could see the bones sticking out. And so they complained to the Indian agent. And so the Indian agent and the priest went down there and asked the people there at Squaditz to, uh, to take the, their loved ones down and bury them. So that's why that cemetery is there. A lot of people question, why is that cemetery there between the highway and the railroad? It's, you know, it doesn't make sense to put a cemetery there. Well, that cemetery was there before, before the highway and railroad went through, that burial ground was there. Okay, so that's another, another example. Uh, and of course, we had the grave houses, similar to the grave house that the Tzalchayak uh, tribe is uh, built there at the uh, Kokolitsa. And of course, those grave houses were small, uh, uh, small houses that uh, our ancestors were put into um, carved out logs that represented canoes, okay? Because our belief system also talks about how our ancestors moved from, from here to the, what's referred to as the other side. And, and actually just come across that recently, I was looking for, looking for it so I could share it with you guys. Um, I don't know if we have time for it, but I think I could find it here. It's in my, in my, uh, on my computer screen. But the other side is actually the dark side of our world, right? So, um, so you know, I've grown up hearing the elders talking about the other side. We all say the other side, but what does that mean? And then in the, in the dictionary, I found the word for the other side, and it actually means the dark side, the other side of the world where it's dark. And we also have protocols and beliefs where we know that when it gets dark, like right now, it's dark, and our ancestral spirits are out there in the darkness, right? And uh, all these different protocols where, you know, we're not allowed to eat unless we close our curtains or close our blinds. Otherwise, it's disrespectful to our ancestor spirits who are out there, right? And I remember also when... Um, I was doing some family genealogy and working with Rosaline and uh, Tilly and Amelia. And we had a gathering at my cousin's place, Rosemary Jack's place in Ruby Creek. And we had it in the evening and we served a meal, got ready for the works, had my, cam my video camera set up. Uh, Carol Peters had her tape recorder set up and had my flip chart. And we we're going to talk about these names that I found in the Oblate records. And all of a sudden, uh, Rosaline looks to Tilly and Amelia. They talk to each other and helps mail them. And, and Rosaline says, oh, we can't do that for you. And, you know, me, I mean, meanwhile, I was working with them every day, translating, like I do that every day with them. And I was surprised that they're saying they couldn't do it. And I said, oh, I, I do this every day with you. And she said, oh, no, no, I don't mean that way. She said, I mean, we can't do it right now. And she said, because it's dark outside. We're going to be talking about names of your ancestors that you probably haven't even mentioned for years and years and years. And if we're going to call them by name, we're going to actually call them. And they're out there, so we're going to be calling them. And if we call them, you better have something for them. So that just like she said, like when we have the burnings, when we call them, we have food and stuff for them. So we shouldn't be calling them, uh, especially in the dark. So they, she said, we can't do that work right now because it's dark outside. So we had to change it to Saturday and start off with the breakfast and do that work. So it's okay to do that work to mention the names of our ancestors during the day, but at nighttime, we're not allowed to not allowed to do that, right? So then the other thing is, and you see this coming back. Um, I know a lot of the, you know, we're turning our backs on Christianity, especially with all this residential school thing that's happening, right? Where we look at uh, the fact that a lot of our funerals no longer have priests. Uh, very few, you know, there's a few that we're, we're a family well invited priests, but 90% of the time, especially up here, up this way, uh, we don't see any priests there. And uh, so it's, there's this whole thing where we're turning turning back against uh, Christianity. But when we start looking at our own belief system, um, there's talk about how, when you look at that relationship from Kwelmuch to Tamuch, that we are part of the, we're part of the earth, that we go back to the earth, right? And so uh, one of the things I noticed as well is that our, uh, a lot of people are going back to the cedar, the, um, cedar caskets. Right for a while there, there's fiberglass caskets and there's you know stainless steel metal, real expensive uh, caskets that families would use. But the only reason for that is for some reason, like why do you need to preserve your body and you know when it's decaying under there and then just prolong that decaying in these different types of uh, of caskets? And we know that if we use cedar, the cedar is going to take a while longer than any other wood, but it's going to take a while 
but eventually we go back to the earth the same way that our ancestors go back to the earth right and uh, so that's important for us and when we look at the other the other thing look at our teachings uh, the shokwam teachings so the stories of khals right so um khulik hotel talks about that it's an awesome statement because i believe it's true is that when khals did the transformations they were writing on the land writing our constitution write our belief system writing our relationships you know all those transformations uh, talk about that but when we look at the other one which is squalquel squalquel uh of course that uh, means true news that's what it states in the dictionary but also the late rosaline and elizabeth said that well it also means your family history and uh elizabeth went on to explain it and she says squalquel um people who are full blooded brothers and sisters share the same squalquel and she says that um squalquel is stories about your parents your grandparents your great grandparents your great 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 grandparents stories about them and anything that they did where they were born where they died where they're buried where they went to school where they fished where they hunted where they gathered berries which part of the longhouse they lived anything like that that's your squalquel and um she said the important part of squalquel is that once you find out uh the places that your ancestors used you have an obligation to go there and use those places and that's why we do that so think about where you fish right now probably where your ancestors fish think about where you hunt right now probably where your ancestors hunt so it's still it's continuing you know so she said that we once we learn about those places we have an obligation to go back and use those places why because our ancestors are still there using those places they're still there when we're actually there we're rubbing shoulders with our ancestors and uh, it took me a while to figure that out um and it figured that out by um talking with uh, the late uh, Setwam or um the late Andy Commodore from uh, Suwali talked about how um he said if you ever go back to a place that your ancestors used and it's a place that you've never used make sure you spend the night so that you get so that your ancestor spirits get to know you right so don't spend a day cuz they're not out spend the night and then they'll get to know you get to know who you are right and then you know i had my own experience you know i ended up going back to eslau for the very first time fishing where my great 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 grandfather is buried in the cemetery there me and my late brothers um the late ralph louis and the late lauren mckelsey uh we went there and we pulled into the pulled into the bay and the sharp rock was sticking out my zodiac went up against a sharp rock punctured a hole and had a hauler to get a ride down to yale to get my uh, patch patch canoe or get my patch to patch the hole in the zodiac and the very last thing on the instructions was let dry for 24 hours <laughs> so here we were up in eslau on the other side of the, from the highway so no highway where we were at and we ended up camping and not only that we ended up um, sleeping in the in the cave in the cave that was probably used by our ancestors as well and so it took me a couple of weeks to remember what andy commodore had said and i realized well my belief now is that my ancestor spirits made us spend the night so that they could get to know us because we were returning to that place to use that place hadn't used it before in my whole life and I was returning and then they needed to needed to get to get to know us right so that's what we talk about is that that's connection that that's out there on the land and also when you look at um oh my my brain just slipped um oh what is it word for gifts 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 um oh khamis skhamis there we go thanks uh, skhamis when you look at that skhamis is all these things so it's not just uh not just the deer and the fish and all in the plants and animals it's it's also our teachings that's a rosaline and lilbus said anything how we do our burnings how we do our winter dance all those different things that is also khamis that is also that is also also our gifts as well. Okay, so um one of the most recent things that I come across and I'm pretty excited about this because uh, because it helps with this what we're talking about here. And if any of you have a dictionary handy, you can open it up to page 895. And in there is the word wassail. Okay? And wassail means share a meal. Right? So that's what it says share share a meal, but usually the share a meal is like the meaning but not the literal translation so when you look at what is the literal translation you get a better understanding of it as well and the cool thing here is when you look at that word wassail wa uh comes from the word um 
yawa, which is a long, and also comes from the word siwal, which is the word for ancestors. Okay? Now, awful in the mouth. So when you share a meal, what are you doing? You're putting your ancestors in your mouth. See that? So then, well, like how? Well, how are you putting your ancestors in your mouth? Because our ancestors have gone back to the earth. What comes from the earth? Everything comes from the earth. Everything that we eat, all our food, even the, the deer feed on the plants, that that's, everything comes from that earth. Where does it come, where does it come from? Our ancestors. So, and that's why it's so important for us we all know every time we have a gathering, there always has to be a meal. We always have to share a meal. We always have to put our ancestors to our mouth, share to um, share our meal, right? So that shows us that connection. And the other thing too is the uh, last one, I think, is um, the whole thing about acknowledging the whose territory you're in. Okay, so when we look at the how uh, Elizabeth talks about um, Squawquel. How you know how our ancestors and in, in, in the late Andy Commodore as well, our ancestor spirits are out there and they're all around us on this land, right? So all our ancestors for thousands and thousands of years have lived here, going back to the earth, coming back as food, and we go back to the earth, right? So and so our ancestors are all around us. And so when you think about it, when you travel away from your ancestors outside of your territory and you go somewhere else. You know, there's always that acknowledgement. And I realized what that acknowledgement was because I could feel it. I don't know if any of you can experience this. Maybe, maybe some of you might have felt this already. When you leave your, your land, when we leave Saftmuch, you know, when we leave this, this territory, our ancestor spirits are back here. So when I go to Hawaii, well, I got Hawaiian ancestry, so maybe not a good example. Uh, but other places, if I go there and there's... Um, I don't have that same connection. Okay, say when I say when in Papua New Guinea, right? And every day, and you always you always make sure you acknowledge whose land you're in. Why is that? Because when you acknowledge the people that are living, you're also acknowledging the people, their ancestors who are gone, right? The same way that when we call witnesses and we call a witness and your name, you know, takes lots of goes back. How many generations? You probably don't even know the full, full amount. It's probably way farther than you can imagine, right? And so when we call that name, we're not just calling the one that's alive today. We're also, to me, it's like we're calling that ancestor, of, that all the ancestors that carried that name. It's like their spirit is all there as well, right? So, so that kind of shows me that uh, that connection as well. And so when we're traveling, and we don't have our ancestor spirits with us, we have to acknowledge you know, whose land it is, and we pay respect, we make sure we carry ourselves right, we're not going to do anything while we're in somebody else's territory, we're going to behave, because our ancestor spirits are back home, and not really there in that land taking care of us, right, we can have our prayers and stuff to our ancestor spirits, but, but we're kind of like vulnerable, because we're not in our land, but as soon as we get our back home, you all know the feeling of getting back home, right, you're back home, your ancestor spirits are there, you know, you're connected to that land and yeah, everything is there. So that's all I can think of right now as to um, why we do this work or the work that we're doing. It's a really, really important work and my hands go out to the house of respect and everybody that's involved and uh, Dave as well, your involvement, uh, helping us uh, uh, doing this work and all the community members that are part of the house of respect as well. We have many, many community members uh, throughout, the, throughout the territory. And um, also acknowledge um, Chalatal, uh, Dave Sheppey and I were, uh, did some work there when we thought we found an ancestor. Some ancestral means turned out to be a, a bare bone, but I didn't know this in the past. And this is a, something good, especially with the Telfeyak who talk about an ancestor being transformed into a black bear. Well, the black bear skeletal remains are so close to human, you have to, like that one bone that they found, Dave said it looks human, but it could be bare. And we had actually had to, actually had to examine it under a microscope to make sure to, to conclude that it was actually bare, not human, right? And so we ended up working with Chalto elders at that time as to what do you do when we find ancestral remains? So a lot of the policy that we have in, in our policy, our heritage policy is kind of based on the teachings from, uh, from Chalto. Uh, and the importance of uh, understanding, you know, knowing who our ancestors are. And that's why we're open, you know, to uh, scientific examinations to determine whether or not that's actually 
our ancestor and that sort of thing. And also important to um, the disturbance of our ancestors, right? So I remember, I don't know um, if you might remember this, uh, but uh, uh, quite a few years ago, there was a, a hillside up the Chilliwack Valley. Uh, Dave, you probably remember this as well. The hills, on the hillside were these ancestral boat remains that were getting washed away. And I remember we were wondering like, what do we do with this? And when we went to, uh, to see uh, Shaiskowit and asked her about what do we do with those remains? And she says, let them wash away. If it's nature that's washing away, they're gonna get washed away. They're gonna go into the river and they go back, become part of the earth as that's where we're all going. But if there's somebody digging them up, disturbing them, then we're gonna go and stop them. Right, but that was the important teaching that she shared, and I, you know, fully understand that if nature is going to wash us away or whatever, well, we're still going back to the earth, right? And so we're not going to fight nature and stop stop uh, our remains from being washed away. So that's yeah. all I could think of right now. Yeah. Wow. I I just I, I it fills up my heart and my mind just to listen to you, Sonny. Hear what you know, share. Thank you so much. I'm, I know we have a limited time. I'm going to turn back to Alia. Uh, just maybe we have closing remarks now. Is that where we're at? Yeah. Thank you for being aware of the time. I really feel as though we use the space in an effective way to hear the different perspectives and the history around the work that's happening in our territory. A few comments from our online viewers is um, Karen Goodfellow says, thank you for this time and wisdom. Um, we have uh, hands up and gratitude from Alita Sapas. Um, some of the older generations, such a loss of culture I've experienced. Thank you for sharing these teachings. One question that was shared uh, here, I'm not quite seeing all of them, but I know our team is collecting them. Um, thank you for the panel. Thank you, Uncle Stephen from Joanne. There was a question here. Thank you so much. I could listen to them speak all day long. Thank you for your knowledge from Councillor Nikki Rock. Um, I'm just, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open this up to see if I can see all of the comments because they are uh, not showing. And there was somebody who had a question my here. My heart and my mind is to listen to you, Sally. Hear what you know, share. Thank you so much. I'm, I know we have a limited time. I'm going to turn back to Alia. Uh, okay, so we have just catching up here on the comments. Sorry about the lag there. Um, so Richard Malloway shares with us, it's clear here. The messages from Elaine, yes, I can hear. Um, hands of gratitude from Laverne, from Low Stark, OCM, thank you for your words. We have gone astray from our teachings. Our teachings need to come back. I try to share what I know to many younger generations. It's not been taught. Amazing story. Thank you, Sunny, for your wisdom. So the question here says, what becomes of residential school remains? And I feel like that's a really big question that's being posed by someone who's on, on the online video with us. Um, Chat when our, Chad Archie says, thanks for all the history and teachings. Jens Malloway just got online and what a nice surprise these faces are. Uh, Jacqueline Lewis, thank you for sharing your knowledge. So one question we have uh, from somebody who's on the live with us is what becomes of the residential school remains? And I do not know if, if we even have the time to fully go through a topic that is that in depth, but have you, any of you come up against this question in our territory or with other communities who are maybe facing this question right now with the discovery of the 215 and all the other different um, young children's remains that have been discovered in the past year. And uh, Grand Chief, you need to 
just get a little closer to your mic. I have a feeling the input volume is not up too high. So just so we can hear you clearly, thank you. I, I'll just say this, that the children that have been found now, they must be returned to their families. Our problem, of course, is that they've been here for so long. Their names appear on some of our headstones, even at Skokal here. Where are their families? Who are their families? It might be that too much time has passed. But it's all possible. Children want to go home. That's what the message came to Gwen when she was working at St. Mary's. They were saying to her, we didn't want to go home dressed like the way they were, that's all. They wanted proper clothes to go home. And it's, it's going to be challenging, I think, the path homeward. And if at all possible, these young people who lost their life in these residential schools should go home where they come from to be with their families. It's going to be challenging, but that's what I know should happen. Very like that has been listening to her brother Stephen talking, and she agrees with you that wherever possible, we need to bring them home. Want to come and share it then? Well, Elix was talking to an elder from the island, from Songhees, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some comments made. She's going to share with you what was shared with her with regard to bringing um, our ancestors home. To um, her name Cecilia or Cecilia Dick, was that her name, Dave, or Cynthia Dick? I always get confused whether it's Cecilia or or Cynthia that came back with Florence. I think it was Cynthia. Yeah, but anyway, she um, I saw her on the weekend, and she was saying that her her older sister and her older brother. Um, have been digging graves for their loved ones for many years. And so there's this um, situation with a family here from Chilliwack and they were wanting to bring their ancestor home, but he's been there for 50 years or more. And so when she was talking to him about it, he said that it might be... Um, impossible to bring anything up from from the ground because because of the time you know we say ashes to ashes dust to dust and he was saying that what is left there is probably all dust so it's a question of how the families want to take care of that um, when it comes to their loved ones it would be hard to try and um, bring them home uh, as saying that, you know, they want to physically bring them home, but there's a way that, you know, that can be done. And, you know, they can go, like he, he was, he was telling um, Cynthia that her, um, her brother was saying that, you know, if the family wants to come over here 
and find out, you know, and see where their brother has been all these years, then they can go home and they can set up a, a marker at home. And that was probably probably the best way he could think of doing it because it, it would be too hard to try and find anything left in the ground, so. Yeah. You have to remember that the old people looked after their, their loved ones themselves. I remember as a child, so over 70 years ago, being in Matsqui when one of the elders there passed. And uh, Uncle Martin, Flo uh, Julian, and my grand auntie, Flora, they took deceased into their home and looked after him, took care of him, fixed him, prepared him for, for burial. I remember they told us to go in the bedroom and they closed the door, but I snuck out and, and I was peeking around the corner and Auntie Flora and a couple of other ladies had the, the, our dear deceased elder on the table and they were bathing him. And then the, from they later wrapped him in a blanket and Uncle Martin had his two boys go up to the hill and bring back some cedar and they made a cedar box for this dear elder who passed and then they carried him up to the cemetery and buried him there. So that gives you an idea of how our elders looked after those who had passed. And think about it, it's the same thing that happened in, in Equiquius in Skalkeil. They put their loved ones in a cedar box and let Mother Earth, and then let the remains go back to Mother Earth and join Mother Earth again, become one. Well, the same thing happened to our ancestors as they were looked after by our, our now ancestors who were elders at that time. And what Helen was saying, there over in Songhees, the two elders that were discussing this, a brother and a sister uh, whose family was a um, long time ago were made responsible for the burials. Well, we had the same thing here in, in, um, in Dikukuyus too. It was the Malloway family that was moved to that because the cemetery was there, they were made responsible for looking after all of the burials. And to this day, it, that's still the case. And I remember too, Auntie Sweetie, Sweetie Malloway, as soon as there was a death, she was the one who was there to prepare the meals. So the families all looked after that and took, took care of each other. And, you know, the, again, it was the old traditions of our poor, weak human bodies returning to Mother Earth. And of course, they made that possible by creating their own um, cedar, cedar boxes, both above the ground and in the ground. You know, and I, I was taken up to Chilliwack Lake, just above the lake by um, one of the Wheelick boys who was working for um, Stella research at, for, for a summer. And he took me up to a cave and he said, there was some ancestral remains found in this cave. And he said, they're probably your ancestors because the Cholatza lived just up there on the hill. So that's something that our ancestors who lived up there, there was all, you, you couldn't bury them anywhere because it was all rocks. So where did they take care of their loved ones? They put them in a burial cave and they, of course, blocked the entrance. So I think those are all of the things, again, you return to Mother Earth. You know, you become one with Mother Earth again. And that's the same with what Nechachatzi was saying about those old traditions. And, I th you know, and if we have a chance to find 
remains at these residential schools that are identifiable, then for sure we need to make arrangements to have them brought home because their families are waiting for them. Osha, well, I'm going to stop us there. I, I've got to get to another house right now. I've got yeah, to yeah. Work, work to do up there, my dear ones. I'm sorry that the family's waiting for me in Chiam right now. Oh, gee. Oh, uh, they had a death up there. Now I've got to go try to help the family. So. I think I think what we're going to do is is bring back the the ones that we've had tonight because the the cultural teachings and the history has been so enriching and the people that are watching online are from our communities and they're so grateful more comments pouring in saying thank you for your knowledge and wisdom thank you for the teachings and and just a lot of really positive feedback so you know we'll we'll end uh, there and again thanking you for your time I know there's always so much more that we can share but we will definitely be asking you back please follow us on Facebook Instagram I do a podcast called the Stalo Signal and uh, it's centered around a lot of the teachings that we've received from Nakakatsi's work in our communities and and we'll certainly have him back on the podcast as well along with these amazing knowledge keepers we really are so lucky to have our elders our elders did not have all of their elders the way that we do and we are so grateful for all of your your sacrifice your wisdom your work in our communities and and for being here with us for having our backs for being our foundation we are eternally grateful to everything that you have done to set this path of cultural teachings and strength and wisdom for all of us young people that are following you, you know, and, and pretty soon we'll be walking those same footsteps. So it's very surreal. Everything truly is full circle and, and we just love you so much and, and really appreciate you taking time to be with us this evening. Thank you, sweetheart. Okay. Good night, everybody. For that, we're going to sign off uh, right there. Hey, good night. Good night. So how do I turn this on? Okay, it's just that.